it really is a super model there is so much going on with this even straight from the box without any of that buffer beam detail <laughs> there how are you doing thanks again for coming and watching these videos and today we've got another box opening and review and today we're going to take a look at something a little bit special that i've been able to find it's something i've been looking for for a long long time the hornby class 31 in regional railways livery it's taken some time to track one of these down but we've got one here so without further ado let's take a closer look what we have here is uh, Class 31 from Hornby and this is actually one of the super detail models. It's actually uh, one of the first um, diesel electric super detail models that they introduced when they had to up their game to compete with the likes of Backman. And they really pulled out all the stops with this and uh, I was quite lucky actually. I went into a shop and you haven't been able to get this in the regional railways livery for a good few years now but they still had one in stock brand new this isn't second hand and I just couldn't resist it I really do love the regional railways livery and uh, Hornby are a bit of a pain in the neck with the class 31 model now they had some bad experience right back at the beginning when they first introduced it with zinc mazak rot uh, with the chassis causing a lot of issues and to do a lot of warranty replacements and they're still models turning up that are just disintegrating in the way that dinky toys used to do uh, from before the second world war however the regional railways model is clear of the zinc mazic pest uh, i did my research so i thought why not so we've got a catalog number on the end there we've got r2963 uh, so we see all the details there in the peculiar way that Hornby likes to do these boxes with a little transparent window. And they don't like to show you the actual model. So what we've got here is this is actually a printed photograph on a piece of cardboard of the model. And I don't know why, because the model is there in there. <clears throat> Just uh, get this out of the box. And we can see this is, I think this was out in, it's about 2010, 2011. So it's not the first batch of these models, uh, but certainly it's from a period where they went pretty gung-ho with packaging. So it's quite an art form to get this in and out of the box. But these days, for some reason, Hornby don't reissue uh, the Super Detail Class 31 all that much. And it's very limited deliveries you can get. Um, so the sectorization liveries such as this one haven't been out for a good long while and I think at the moment uh, there's a Dutch livery and a network rail yellow livery um, that I have seen about and uh, oh, also DCR and in fact actually that can be had at quite a good markdown because not many people wanted that livery but despite the clamour from um, railway modellers for more releases of the BR Green and also the BR Blue models, Hornby haven't really delivered. And I suspect part of the problem, as I dismantle this rather overly complicated uh, packaging that it comes in, is that this was designed back in the days when manufacturing in China really was very cheap. So they could load it up with all manner of uh, extra detail for the sake of it, uh, and it didn't add a lot to the cost, but now when you come to try and assemble this, I think the RRP is up to around the 160, 170 pound mark, and it really is getting a really expensive model. So I'm going to get this out, and uh, as you can see, there's a lot of, of polystyrene and all sorts. And tucked away in the top there, I'm just going to try and put this locomotive down. We get a little tiny packet and in there we've got couplings for the front and back. These go in on NEM pockets and there's a wealth of buffer beam detail there to add. So um, all very fiddly and if you add the buffer beam detail you can't then 
have the couplings. It's a, a one or the other. So as a compromise, what most people would do is that they would uh, populate one end of the model with all the detail and leave the other end with a coupling so you can still pull a train. The only time I reckon you, you'd add all of that to both ends is if it's, it is simply going to just live in a display cabinet. So I'm going to put them in there so they don't go missing. And let's get some of this packaging out of the way. You can also see it came with this and what I've found is that this little sleeve here is if you DCC fit the locomotive it's kind of expecting you to have a chip on a wiring harness and the idea of this is it's um, an insulating sort of like sleeve more, more than anything that goes around your chip and just stops any risk of shorts when it's in the locomotive. Well We've got the locomotive out here and it really is a super model. There is so much going on with us, even straight from the box without any of that buffer beam detail added. You can see we've got a very, very fine model. And even from the factory, there's a lot of separately applied details. Now, the real Class 31s were actually part of the pilot scheme on British railways that included things like the class 20s but they were initially allocated the tops um, classification class 30. They were built by Brush Traction, first one delivered in 1957 but they were fitted with a Merlis engine that proved not very reliable so British Rail did take the uh, view that uh, it was worth re-engining the entire class and that was done with a downrated English electric power unit. In fact the same power unit that went into the class 37s but it was downrated because it needed to be to not blow the electrical gear in the locomotive so it was set to a power level that was the maximum that the electrical gear in the locomotive could handle. Because that engine was downrated it actually did make them a very reliable class of locomotives which is uh, you know, it's quite ironic given that as a class 30 they were not a good locomotive at all. What we can see here, we've got a lot of separately applied Louvre details. We've got separately applied wire handrails and they are nicely fitted in there. Flush glazing all the way around both cabs. And then we've got the windows there with the, the bars in there. Flush glazed, but one detraction is that I can actually see the motor and the, the internal gubbins of the chassis itself through there. I know in later models, like for example the Class 71, there was such an attention to detail, but you know, early days this appeared somewhere around 2004, 2005, I think. Um, so whilst it was a, a quantum leap over models that had appeared before it, there's still a lot of things which they then subsequently went on to develop better. I mentioned about the cab doors being able to open and uh, it's actually, it is very gimmicky, I'll be honest with you, I can't really see much of a reason for this because to get them to stay open, they're on a spring, is incredibly difficult. So what I'm going to do is try and find something I can prod them open with because if I use my finger, you're not going to be able to really see much. I won't use the pencil end because I don't want to draw all over this. But you can see that the cab doors do actually open there. And there's quite a, a fearsome spring on there. And one thing that a lot of people have mentioned to me, uh, because the Class 8 diesel shunter also has these spring-loaded doors, and I think the Class 50 does too, um, is if you had a very, very tiny sliver of plastic, you could wedge them slightly open. And that would just add a little bit of uh, detail interest on the model. But... As a rule, they just spring very tightly shut and um, it's really detail for the sake of detail. We've got a few separately applied bits and pieces going on down at uh, below the sole bars, but these, these bogies are actually really nicely done. And if we turn the locomotive over, we can see that there's a lot of air gaps going on in here. You can see right through the structure uh, the way it's been designed and it really is lovely and they've got um, all wheel drive every single wheel on this model is driven from the centrally mounted uh, motor which is actually um, <laughs> means it's got a lot better traction theoretically than the real one which was technically an A1A A1A now that probably sounds like white noise to some people but what it means is driven wheel idler driven driven idler 
driven on the real locomotive. If it had been a true all-wheel drive as this model is, it would have been a plain and simple Coco. So just a little bit of something there for you. And the gear train is quite neatly hidden away, right down, neatly down the center. So there's actually a lot of space in there to be able to re-gauge this model without any great hassle. So if you model in EM or P4, this is actually all set up, ready to go. You can just uh, widen out the wheels on the axle and there's no messing about. So that's something that a lot of people We'll probably find quite useful. Whilst I've got it upside down you can also see um, there's NEM pockets there and this is on a close coupling mechanism. I'm going to find my pencil again and when I move that there like that this is exactly the same style of close coupling mechanism as the coaches have which is pretty nice and that's quite smooth and it's spring-loaded so it always returns to the centre position. Um, and being a NEM pocket, you can put on all manner of perfectly standard couplings that use the NEM standard if you so desire. I'll just be using the slimline tension lock couplings because that's what all my stock uses. We've got the front end of the locomotive captured really, really well. The buffers are all sprung, but you'd expect that from a super detail model. And we've got the face captured perfectly. This model is a class 31 subsection 4, and that means it's an electric train heat uh, fitted version. Now, these were actually very, very underpowered in real life. And part of the problem was that uh, anywhere up to one third of the engine power was absorbed by the electric train heat mechanism because of the way that it was set up inside in such a manner that even if you weren't using all of that electric train heat power you couldn't redirect it and redeploy that power to the traction motors so it meant that these could only ever run at two thirds the engine rating. In later locomotives they did modify that so that you could use surplus ETH power to drive the train but uh, certainly these were notorious for being a little bit underpowered especially as in regional railways use one of their duties would have been trans pennine work going up and over the tops. The body side is captured perfectly. We've got the name printed on there, North Yorkshire Moors Railway. Now there aren't any etched um, nameplates coming with this model, which some people might find a little bit of a detraction, but I have to be honest and say, I've never fitted etched nameplates that have come with locomotives. And one that I can think of in particular that I've got in my collection is I've got a Backman Class 37 in intercity livery Bully Day, which did come with uh, etched nameplates, and I've never applied them. And to be honest, I don't think really the quality of tempo printing is in any way poor enough to warrant it. I think you know, I think that the the finish of the tempo printing on this is good enough that, to my eye, it's not worth the effort. We've got very crisp uh, livery application. The Regional Railways livery, well. It does show up um, if you have a fault with a model, and that is, this is something that the Backman Class 101 fell foul of. The Regional Railways uh, livery application, the, the coloured bars across there, are so precisely needing to be in a certain place on the locomotive that if anything is out of proportion or has been made in the wrong place, it really shows it up. But in this model, everything to my eye looks perfectly correct. We've also got the tops data panels down there at the bottom and I have every faith that the tempo printing on this model is so crisp and sharp that even though I can't see it with my naked eye the uh, magnification of the lens on the camera is going to pick them up just fine. We've got the red cantrail line perfectly um, put on there and we've got the shade of grey for the roof really really spot on and actually it looks really good. I've seen the Dutch liveried model and in my view the shade of grey that they used for the roof on that made it look a little bit toy-like but this particular model suffers none of those problems. On the roof detail well everything is there. The relief on it is just right. It's not overly clumsy to get the detail to stand out but by the same token the detail that needs to be there is perfectly visible to the extent it needs to be. The fan itself, I really do have to draw your attention to this, we've got a lovely metal grille over the top 
But take it from me, when I was test running this locomotive, this fan actually spins as the locomotive runs along. And this is a bit like the Class 50 has a similar setup and it has a rubber band drive to the fan to make it spin. It's, again, it's a little bit gimmicky because Really, that fan should be spinning pretty much all the time that the engine's running. So when the locomotive is stationary, obviously the, the fan does spin down. And I find that that becomes a little bit of a distraction. Whereas if they hadn't had it spinning, your eye wouldn't have been drawn to it to notice that it stops spinning when the locomotive stops running. Overall, I have to say, the locomotive, even though it was old stock that had been sat in the model shop for a number of years, was still relatively expensive and those prices are only going up and up. So in terms of value for money, I would say that the Hornby Class 31 is a little bit lacking in that department. I think Hornby went all in, Banzai style, and loaded it up with an awful lot of gimmicky things, like, for example, the sprung-loaded doors, the spinning fan, without realising that as soon as manufacturing costs went up in China, it would make it a prohibitively expensive model to put together. That said, it is the best model of the Class 31 that has ever appeared. And they have actually appeared from a number of manufacturers in the past, including going right back, an atrocious model from Airfix, which even had plastic solid renditions of some of the wheels, which was really quite bizarre. But this model, in my view, is the definitive model in 00. Now, some people have said that the railroad version, which is based on a warmed up lima moulding, has a slightly better body shape at the top of the cab roofs. But I feel that overall as a package, there is there's no contest between the two. If you want the definitive Class 31 model, you want this model. Anyway, thanks very much for watching the video and uh, don't forget to like, share and subscribe and uh, have a look back through. We've got plenty of videos there for you to take a little gander at. But until next time, you take very good care of yourself. This is me, Jenny Kirk, saying bye for now. Today's video has been brought to you by my books, Bringing Home the Stars, Twinkle Little Star, and also you can get the complete comic collections of All Over the House, Books 1, Books 2, and also the wacky zany Life of Knobty Mouse. Thanks and catch you later.